Hey there, 10 Minute Traders, and welcome back to the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. On the phone today, we've got Steve Burns, the legend himself, and we're going to be talking about his book, New Trader, Rich Trader. This is the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com. Steve, thank you so much for coming back on the show and allowing us to, uh, to ask you questions and go through this book today. Hey, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, man. So... The first thing that I picked up right away on this book was the fact that it was written um, almost like a first person story and it was not what I expected at all. I expected it to be some sort of like textbook uh, textbook platform, I guess you could say. And it wasn't that at all. It was almost like a rich dad, poor dad. So tell me tell me a little bit about the inspiration on, on that. Yeah, New Trader Rich Trader is really uh, my attempt to create a enjoyable read by tearing a narration and also encompassing all of the uh, principles that I've learned from uh, ex extensive study of all the uh, rich traders through uh, a lot of the writings of Michael Covell and Jack Swager who actually went and interviewed them thoroughly along with my own uh, 20 plus year experience of uh, being successful in the stock market. I wanted to create the book that I wish I would have had when I started uh, trading instead of having, you know, reading hundreds and hundreds of trading and investing books, you know, and then it all worked out in the long term. I realized I could have only read 20 or 30 and been just as successful. So I just wanted to create that book I wish I would have had for a shortcut. Yeah, what a, what a great idea. And as I was going through this, I mean, that's what I was doing the entire time was I was like, oh, I identify with that on Rich Trader. Oh, I identify on that on Rich Trader. Oh, I identify that on Rich Trader, and I've been doing this for 2009 marks my 10th year of trading. So I certainly have a lot that uh, I can identify with on the, <clears throat> the the novice trader on this, which I was kind of surprised by, to tell you the truth. Yeah, and a lot of the new trader aspects is the young me and the and the journey I went through with the with especially the psychology and the risk management and learning all the lessons the hard way. And at, at times, I also my voice is in the rich trader side. As I did, I was eventually successful over my 28 year journey and ended up being financially independent in the long run. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was sort of like me talking to my younger self in a lot of ways. Oh, man, what a, what a brilliant way to, uh, to structure that. In fact, I think I had heard Tim Ferriss say in at least one of his interviews, and I, I believe in at least one or two of his books, talking about how occasionally you should sit down and and imagine you and your older self are sitting on the porch on the porch swing next to each other and your older self is talking to your younger self what would he say to you today what would you know ahead of time uh, that's brilliant i i uh i really really think you've you've encapsulated that in this book for sure yeah, and for the uh, the podcast and youtube audience here uh everything we're going to be talking about today is going to be linked down in the description below uh steve's book new trader rich trader and be sure to check it out. It's on Amazon, uh, Kindle. It's on paperback. It's on audio book by Audible. Um, and you'll right away notice all the five star reviews. And that should give you an indicator that he definitely knows what he's talking about. And he, he definitely hit it out of the park with this one for sure. I yeah, appreciate that, Chris. Uh, you know, like Matthew McConaughey also said, you know, his heroes and his uh, his hero is is himself in 10 years. So he looks up to who he would be in 10 years. Wow, that's a great idea. So, all right. So what I was telling Steve, uh, what I want to do for this uh, introductory uh, book series here. Now, Steve, I'm, I'm sure you remember from our first podcast, he has written a library of books and uh, he's agreed that we could go through them all. And essentially, we can all learn together. And I was telling him that the last trading book I read was a couple of years ago and I shelved it and I was like, I don't need to read any more trading books. And the reason I felt that way is because I just got mad. By the time I got done with it, I didn't agree with anything the author had said. I was very disappointed and I was thinking to myself, if this is the first trading book someone picked up, they're going to be worse off having read it than if they hadn't read it. And yeah, that, I was really jaded. So I'm really glad that uh, Steve and I got together so I could actually pick that back up and definitely improve some of my knowledge and hopefully improve some of your knowledge as well by, by being part of the podcast. I mean, it's called how to trade stocks and options. We definitely want to learn how to trade those stocks and how to trade those options and, and having wealth of resources like Steve on the line uh, can really help us with that. So what, what I thought I would do is go through um, maybe not every chapter, but a lot of the book and talk about some of the things that I took away and some of the things that probably Steve had intended 
and uh, really talk about those those different points and how he and I both learn from our own experiences uh, and and how they're translated here. And I definitely feel that learning through uh, experiences with real money um, and not necessarily paper trading all the time can really help. I mean, we we the the book goes into paper trading some, but uh, I've talked about before how after losing two thirds of my account when I first started. Uh, I went back and I started paper trading my my butt off essentially because I had to prove to myself that I knew what I was doing because obviously I didn't know what I was doing when I first started. So the first chapter here, uh, I mean, the first line of the book essentially, Steve says, new traders are greedy and have unrealistic expectations. Rich traders are realistic about their returns. And I definitely agree with that. So Steve, um, you know, let's let's lead into that real quick. What have you seen um, on that uh, unrealistic expectation set by by new traders. Well, the the endless thing I see over and over again is somebody wants to trade for a living out of the gate where they are not properly capitalized to begin with. You know, you're not going to try to open up a sub shop with with two thousand dollars. So I don't know how people think they're going to trade for a living for a few thousand dollars, but they they don't understand. There's two sides of the coin. You have to put the risk on to get the return. And the, and the magnitude of your risk is what determines your return. If you put on too much risk right out of the gate, you're going to end up uh, blowing up your account with a few losing trades. And so many people just can't wrap their brain around. You need a large sum of – to be properly capitalized based on what your goals are. Now, you can start with any amount of money if you just want to trade and compound money. But to uh, you know trade for a living seriously, you need a large uh, multiple-figure uh, trading account along with a minimal debt. But they all want to get rich quick, and that's the that's why they all blow up uh, so fast. Greatest oh, no doubt. To, yeah, the greatest, the greatest path of being broke with your trading account is trying to get rich quick. I mean, it's just a, you, you cannot trade so big without ruining yourself. It just the math does not work over the long term. Right. In fact, uh, in in this uh, starting page here, Steve talks. You know, new trader projected he could double his account in a few months and then double it again. And that's the dream, right? You you hear all these stories, especially on on social media, uh, which I have uh, really starting to get a, a a bitter taste in my mouth from social media and all these <laughs> these people, right? But the the eleven uh, or the uh, the twenty three year old uh, stock trading millionaire who started with eleven thousand dollars, and it's like, I just you know I I guess it's possible, but I it's not it's not a great way to get there because you're gonna Man, I, I don't think people understand what it's like to actually go through mentally uh, a big drawdown. Yeah, it's it's a lot of the errors are made with the psychology and the risk management. And what I've oh, seen yeah. so many times, especially in the 90s, I saw so many sort of like the crypto uh, millionaires where they were you were in the right thing at the right time. They were just holding on with no real exit strategy, just like the dot com millionaires. And they yeah, they did make a killing. But if you don't have the proper risk management in place and the right psychology, you don't have an exit strategy, even the ones that do, you know, and I know so many people that's done that made several six figures and even mil- a million quickly when they were young. They all lost it all, blew it all, didn't understand the tax implications of their gains. And uh, they're, what made them so strong holding tech stocks during the bubble was also their biggest weakness from holding them during the plunge in 2001, 2002. Mm-hmm. So not only do you have to make it, but you have to keep it. And that has been one of my best skills over the last 28 years. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like the uh, the whole lottery winners uh, go bankrupt thing, right? And I've seen that in my family. Um, we didn't have lottery winners, but we had some life insurance that came into our family. And mm-hmm. and you've got the people who, who understand how money works and how uh, mm-hmm. you, to grow that money. And then you've got those people who want to spend that money and then they it's gone. Uh I mean, I've seen it firsthand, and that's that's the whole curse of the lottery winners too, right? Is yeah. getting money can mm-hmm. getting money can be relatively easy if you're in the right circumstance, at the right time. But it's it's keeping it, like Steve said, that that's the hard part. Yeah, so capital flows to those who can manage it well, and it flows away from those who cannot manage it. It's just the way it works. Absolutely, it's, it's common sense. Like you said, the lottery winners are a great example of that. They have no idea, you know that. You know, consumerism, you can burn through any amount of money. Like also the sports stars, you know, if you don't know how to manage 10, 20, 30 million dollars, then you're not going to keep it because it's all just going to flow to the people who do. Right. Yeah. There's a, a rapper. You may have heard of him. Maybe not. His name is Six Nine. Um, mm-hmm. Man, I loved so much watching his story and um, his whole Instagram and everything because dude would roll up with like trash bags full of money. 
and just like be throwing it on the ground, making a scene. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to end so badly. <laughs> and and he's in jail now. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm racketeering charges. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my gosh. I uh, as soon as he came on the scene, I was like, oh, this is going to be one to watch. And that was a lot of fun to watch. While it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick sale. It was a quick story. Yeah. So, so much of finance and trading is uh, personal finance and trading is uh, behavioral. Oh, yeah, no doubt. In fact, uh, you know, on the next page here, one one thing that you mentioned and and I have seen as well, you're you're hoping to to double your account and double your account again. And you say right here in black and white, that hot stock you're in love with could just as easily fall 50 percent instead of doubling in price. And man, have I seen that. I have seen that firsthand, like like any stock from today going forward mm-hmm. has a 50-50 chance of going up or down. And it doesn't matter how much backtesting or analysis or anything you do. There's there's every possibility it will go down. But it's the risk mitigation mm-hmm. associated with that that will either blow up your account or increase mm-hmm. your account. Yeah it's, it's actually, yeah, it's actually the structure of trade management because you do not know, regardless of what people think they can predict and call and name and all that, all that. It doesn't. What really matters is your stop loss. If you're in a stock at fifty dollars and your stock's at, your stop loss is forty five, and you and your and it doesn't work out, you get out at forty five. But if you can let the trend run and you're right, you might get out at seventy, eighty, ninety, which that's what creates the risk reward ratio. Mm-hmm. What are you risking for a chance to get the reward? Right. And this particular point that Steve's talking about was the biggest takeaway for me for the entire book. And I'm sure that there's like several chapters devoted to that. But with options trading, everything that I had been taught from various different sources was if you put on a defined risk trade to just let that thing play out. So let's say, for example, I have a $5 wide spread and I've taken in a $1.50 in credit. That means my max Mm -hmm. risk in the trade is $350. Well, if that's a loser, it's now going to be $350 I have to make up just to break even. And mm-hmm. this is a high probability trade, so the likelihood mm-hmm. of that might be only 30% based on uh, the market maker option prices there. But if I've taken in $150 in credit, I've got a full loser there of $350. That means I'll need more mm-hmm. than two full losers to make up for that one loser. And um, that's kind of where I was like, you know, I feel like there could be better risk mitigation techniques here. Uh, with options trading, as Steve and I have mentioned before, it's an all or nothing bet. And if you're selling options, you do have a higher probability of, of profit in that case because the stock can move up or down or, or stay where it's at. Uh, but the the risk management side of it, I feel that just in general, out, uh, out where I had learned trading from, uh, really wasn't in check. So I got to thinking more about this and I was doing some math and I don't have it here with me, but what I had found is if you if you're able to close it for less than um, like if your full winner would have been 150 and you uh, do risk management for at least 150 or less, maybe 100 or whatever the case is um, overall, because you have a higher win rate, that's going to result in a more profitable outcome than if you're just going to hold and let those occasional mm-hmm. big losers wipe out several mm-hmm. of the winners. Yeah, that that was the biggest takeaway for me for the entire book. Yeah, the actual tr- active trade management to always minimize losses and maximize gains at all time, however that however that plays out. Like I, mm-hmm. one thing I advise people with the, their option trading is, you know, the, when the risk reward ratio no longer favors you, go ahead and close the option trade. Because the odds are you have less the the gain by leaving it open as you do by just go ahead and locking in what you have. You know, go ahead and close it. Yeah, I agree. You know, a lot of that actually leads into chapter two, where new traders make wrong decisions based on uh, on stress, and rich traders can manage stress. And you know, Steve, like I say, this this book really opened my eyes to a different world that I I wish I had known about sooner. I guess you could say, uh, because on the risk management side, I was just letting things go and definitely stressing about them. Whereas uh, if I had employed some rich traders' techniques, I would have cut my losses. And said, you know what? Didn't work out. That's totally fine. This is part of my trading plan. Occasionally, I'm going to have losses, and then look for the next one. It's so crucial that this, that's the mental side of it. Even if for entrepreneurs or for executives and for uh, and traders, the, the psychological part is so important that you enter it like a business. You know, no trade should really be so large that it puts stress and discomfort and 
and that messes make makes your emotions so loud you can't hear a trading plan anymore. You know, if you can get it to a business operation strategy with your trading, it could be revolutionary. And so many people, uh, me included, traded so big, went for so much so early. Uh, when a st- more steady process, eliminating the the stress and the and the uh, emotions would have been a, a better quality of life as well. Oh, no doubt, absolutely. And in here, um, actually on the the Kindle, it shows the highlighted lines, or, or it shows the lines that have been highlighted the most. And this one in particular was highlighted the most on this topic. It says, before you place a trade, you need to have an exit strategy of how, when, and why you will take profits and what your stop loss will be. You need to have a plan to sell your stock at a specific percentage loss, price support breach, or trend change. And I've been very, very open about my terrible gold trade last summer. And all of the above, which you just said in that paragraph there, is exactly what I did wrong. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I was trying to uh, to pick the bottom and go long. I had no indicator at all whatsoever as far as moving averages. And, and certainly, I was trying to play against the trend, which, uh, as we'll get to later, the, the trend really is... Uh, an easier way, I guess you could say, to to profit in, in whatever market. I mean, you want to be a part of the trend, right? You want to be jumping into the water and going with the stream rather than trying to stream, swim upstream. Yeah, you want to go with the path of least resistance that increases your odds of success dramatically by simply going with the flow. And when you do want to buy a bottom or you do want to buy, you actually wait till the market confirms with a reversal that also increase, increases the odds dramatically than just going in and catching a falling knife. Wait for mm-hmm. the knife to stick in the ground. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Um, I, I That's been my biggest downfall, was always trying to uh, to be thinking that I was more clever than the market. Uh, reading through this, that, that really was my, my number one thing, is that, A, I, I needed to manage my risk more aggressively, and B, uh, if a stock is going up, that doesn't mean you need to put on a bearish trade. That actually means you might want to look to jump into and uh, go with the flow of that. And, I, and and really, like I say, a lot of this had to do with uh, people I had uh, learned trading from was their, their whole deal is they are contrarian traders. Contrarian traders is great, but you have to be more agile than I was. And you certainly don't want to be a part of... Uh, a, a uh, getting in front of the moving train, I guess you could say. And I, I have put myself in front of so many trains. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, so so much of my money of the long term has always been made by being on the long side of the stock market. Where so many people thought, you know, I was nuts for buying high or, or letting a winner run for so long, but that's where the actual money was made for me. It was just, you know, especially through the '90s and through the 2000, 2003, 2007 bull market. And then again, starting 2009, it's just uh, mm-hmm. get on the right side of the trend and stay there is the best way to make money. I mean, there are frustrating periods of range bound markets and gaps and volatility. But a lot of the times, if you have the right signals, you'll be out of the market waiting for the right uh, reentry. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, in chapter three, you talk about here, new traders are impatient and look for constant action. Rich traders are patient and wait for entry and exit signals. So tell me a little bit more about that, because that I think maybe you've got some strategies or something that maybe I could pick your brains about and, and get some ideas here. Yeah, it's it's really the the drive to want to be doing something and the the action of uh, of always wanting to be in in the market or out of the market. What should I do? Should I enter now? Should I short? Should I buy? Sometimes you shouldn't be doing anything. Sometimes you should have the patient where you say, if the five-day moving average crosses over the 20-day moving average, then I will go long and I will stay long until price goes below both the five and the 20 day, then I will exit. You know, mm-hmm. you have to have the strategy and you have to wait for that signal. So uh, the biggest thing so many times that traders need to be doing, depending on their methodology, is doing nothing, just sitting back and looking at the market. <laughs> and, well, I have no signal here. I'm going to have to wait for volatility to slow down or I'm going to have to wait for the price to get back over the 250 day moving average or mm-hmm. I'm going to have to uh, let oh, well, my winners, my the trend's still up. So I'm going to let my winner run. I'm going to just move my trailing stop up to a shorter term moving average or well, I'm still making money, so I'm gonna I'm not gonna exit this trade until it closes below the previous day's low. You know, just having that strategy and being patient until you get your signal you're looking for. Right, and that right there is key to what uh, Steve talks about in different parts of the book is having having the freedom where you're not chained to your desk. And my whole deal is being a 10 minute stock trader. I want to actively manage my portfolio in as little time as possible, hopefully around 10 minutes a day. 
And to Steve's point, there are days where you open your account and you see, oh, there's nothing to do. Close your account, move on with your day. There's no reason to sit there or watch any, any ticks go by or anything. Here on the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast, we give you the tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And I think the smartest thing you could do is open a new brokerage account with Tastyworks. Tastyworks is a brokerage platform that I use and I recommend. The commission structure is absolutely unbeatable at $1 per leg total. Now, if you sign up for a free Tastyworks account using the code 10 minutes, that's 10MINUTE, I'll give you $150 in free 10 minute trader exclusive bonuses from 10MinuteStockTrader.com just for opening a free account at Tastyworks. Remember to use the code 10 minute, that's 10MINUTE, when signing up for your new Tastyworks account today. So one question I had on this was, uh, do you have some sort of alerting service or alerting software that uh, if something does cross the 5 and 20, uh, that sends you a text message or sends you an email? Because uh, otherwise, I could see, you know, just pouring through hours and hours of charts, you know, looking from, from one stock to the next. Like, where where do you go to get those entry and exit uh, criteria as far as um, as things cross and things like that? Yeah, I know everybody's different. I know a lot of people, especially younger people, have all the setups and alerts and everything. But but what I still do is I go through my chart, my watch list. I usually have about 20 items on my watch list, you know, maybe 30 with some other things that I'm seeing to enter my watch list. And I actually, in the last 30 minutes of the day, I go through and look at all my charts and look at all the signals on my 20 charts, which, you know, only takes it takes about about 20, 30 minutes to do that because uh, I know what I'm looking for and a lot of mm-hmm. real quick, like, nope, no signal, move on. So I actually physically look through my uh, 20 charts. It also gives me a feel for the the trends and the patterns. Uh, but I get those, the, the watch list items from extensive back testing across um, indexes, sector, I- sector ETFs, and uh, sec- uh, index ETFs, and individual stocks and study that really find the the stocks I think have the best chance of generating alpha because of their dominance in their market and uh, different leverage ETFs for indexes and sectors based on back testing. So it's a pretty, all my hard work is done in the development, back testing and planning stage. When it actually comes to the actual trading, it's pretty quick and easy every day to, to see what my decisions will be based on price action. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So where do you, where do you go for back testing? Do you have a platform you use for that? Uh, my ETF replay gives me great uh, back testing for moving averages across the most index sectors and leading stocks. ETF replay, <laughs> ETFreplay.com, also stockcharts.com, you know, has access to historical charts and uh, looking at the the moving average signals over historical charts as well. Cool. Yeah, I will uh, make sure to add those links to the to the show notes down below. Um, that's actually one thing I wanted to uh, to pick your brains about because when when I have uh, quote done back testing. Uh, I bought one software and it had a lot to do with options. Like if uh, if an iron condor placed at the 25 delta, uh, how that looked over the last nine years. But for me, and and I'm sure you know you would probably think this too. I, I feel like that's somewhat jaded because we've been such a strong bull market. Um, I don't always want to believe that as like gospel because there's every chance as we've seen in the the latter half of 2018 where markets could reverse and this may have had a 91 percent win rate in the past Mm -hmm. or whatever the case is uh doesn't work in this market going forward how do you how do you adjust your strategies uh for that i think like you're saying there's an evolving probability in the markets you know even like a iron condor has a 91 percent win rate yeah it might have when when the price is over the 200 day moving average 90 percent of the time but once that 200 days loss it might shift or that's where the losers happen mm. it's like a lot of crossover signals might have a better probability above a key long-term moving average and uh, less below also volatility you might have a better probability of winning in options if you enter when the volatility is much higher uh peaking out if the vix is o- overbought extremely Mm -hmm. Uh, short option plays might have a higher probability. So I think the probability does shift and change based on the market environment. Oh yeah, I agree. That that's what I've observed. And so while I bought that, I was a little bit disappointed because it it didn't necessarily take into multiple factors in that case. So yeah, I get that. And then especially like you were saying in the book here, you know, rich traders wait for entry and exit signals. Um, 
I have been on the train of I got to do something. So I'm opening my account and I'm just going line by line by line by line, looking down my watch list. And my watch list is pretty simple where I do like because I do mostly uh, options selling. I look for a lot of ETFs because they they actually have a lower beta than the market. So in theory, they should act a little bit better for an option seller. Uh, so that that's where I go to first. Uh, but yeah, I I am very quick to throw trade throw trades away versus quick to put trades on. Uh, and, and it sounds like you may be that way too. Yeah, I'm very cool. I mean, I'm, all, I'm only trying to make money. If I'm not making money, I would just assume exit and uh, take a stop mm-hmm. loss and move on my life or even the time stop if it's not going anywhere. My only purpose of trading is to make money, not to try to prove I'm right or to <laughs> yeah, there you go. Comes back or to wait on something or tie up capital for no reason. So I'm, I'm very quick to move on, which is a, is a strength that I've had as I've gotten older. Yeah, and, and that sounds like it's part of your trading plan, which leads into chapter four here. Uh, new traders trade because they're influenced by their own greed and fear. And rich traders use a trading plan. Yeah, it's, it's a totally different ball game when you're quantified on what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. So many people like, what do I do here? Trying to ask other people on social media. I mean, what do I do? Oh, well, it depends on your trading plan. I mean, the worst thing you do is go look for other people's trades because you don't know their position sizing. You don't know their time frame. You don't know their goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you have to have your own. Ever ask me, what do I need to trade? Number one is a quantified trading strategy, a actual trading system with signals that contains an edge over the long term. That's mm-hmm. the very first step where you need to be letting it manage your trades, not trying to decide on the fly with emotions and ego. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and this is one of the things that I was guilty with as far as um, identifying with new trader. And a lot of that, too, had to do with, uh, like, the contrarian trader inside of me, which definitely has been beat out of me over the last uh, few months or so. But it's, you know, influenced by, by fear and greed. The NASDAQ has been on a huge run lately. You know what? It has to go down. I'm going to buy some puts. That's a great idea. Uh, actually, it's <laughs> not. Um, whereas if I had had a trading plan, I could say, well, if if X meets this criteria, then I maybe I go to the 25 delta and, and do one thing mm-hmm. or another. Uh, and that's something that since reading this book, I've been a lot more adamant about is I wrote down a lot of the points that I took from Steve's book here. And then uh, I've been building up a better, stronger uh, trading plan because of it. Uh, so I'm really thankful for that, actually. Yeah, it's, it's incredible the change you can make when you let you do your trading decisions in your research and development and not in a real time price action. <laughs> yeah. And and in the moment, I've been so guilty of this, too. In the moment. Right. Let's say I have a, a bullish position on and I'm I'm. Well, I'm not anymore, but let's say a, a new trader's glued to the uh, to the ticks, and then <laughs> you know they're they're thinking it looks bullish, and then it goes down. And they're like, oh my god, what just happened? Uh, <laughs> I had somebody reach out to me on social media one day, and they're and and I don't do candlestick patterns at all. I don't even know what they are. Uh, but he's like, I saw a rising star followed by a, a tombstone and a and a ups, upstairs doji, and then uh, a, a, a bottom reversal bear flag flip, and <laughs> Obviously, I don't know what I'm talking about. On these. <laughs> and, and and he's like, but it didn't work the way it's supposed to. What happened? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't read these things. Um, and and I, 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 I mean, that's the deal is that you can be extremely confident something's going to work in your way. And then all of a sudden it doesn't. Uh, but you've got to have your trading plan uh, set for that. Yeah, it's amazing. Two people think it's a 100% win rate. They think they'll have some special pattern or candlestick or reversal that's 100%. Like, there's absolutely no 100%. If there were, were you would own the world pretty quickly with yeah. no losses and compounding yep. capital. Uh, so, you know, the key is the win rate. You might, you have a good 60, 70% win rate. That's a huge success rate for trading. That is a huge, uh, great system. But most systems are going to be about a 50 50, and it's really the trade management of the stop loss. And letting the winner run is going to really determine profitability more than the actual setup. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And I've talked before about how I did an analysis uh, last year. I w- I had put on a bunch of iron condors, and they had it was over a 70% win rate, but the net result was a uh, it was a net loss because the the losers were way bigger mm-hmm. than any of the winners. Uh, going back to what I said earlier in this this episode here, uh, so managing your risk uh, that's that that that's that's probably paramount of, of everything I, I, I took away in this book is, 
you know, there's there's no reason to to set it and forget it if that means you have to make ten trades in a row to offset the one loser. Yeah, exactly. That's something I advise my uh, clients who uh, I uh, I work with for options is, you know, once you go to negative, close your option trade. Once it starts going against you, when your delta when your delta expands, you know, to a point where you go in and your delta might be 0.10, and then your delta goes to a 0.50, 0.60 on a short option trade, you need to get mm-hmm. out. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And and I agree from experience that uh, <laughs> sitting and you know, sit it and forget it is not not a viable strategy, really. Yeah, definitely not short options. <laughs> so chapter six, you talk about here: new traders act like gamblers, rich traders act like business people. I've I've certainly been guilty of that, and and I know that most new traders get into this with the whole Wall Street movie mentality, right? I'm going to risk ten thousand dollars, and you better believe by God that's going to end up to be fourteen million dollars by the end of the week. <laughs> It's so funny, the thing people miss on the casino winners, you know, how many casino winners, how many people do you know go to the casino? They do have a big winning streak against all odds. They do beat the casino. They have, you know, up huge, whatever it is for them, thousands, ten thousands of dollars. And then they still either stay too long and let the their, the casino's edge play out and give it all back. Or they uh, come back and over the long term, they lose it all back slowly to the casino. So even yeah. if they win against the casino with no when they have no edge and no plan, uh, then they still in the long term lose and give it all back. That's the mm-hmm. same thing with trading. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing that I have been working harder on since reading this book is uh, taking my profits earlier, I guess you could say, um, being more aggressive with taking things off the table, uh, off, off the gambling table, I guess you could say, um, for that that purpose too, right? You, you've got every chance to to give it all back if you're not mm-hmm. a li- at least a little bit aggressive on keeping what you have. Yeah, I always have a, either a, tra- a trailing stop really maximize the game, <laughs> so you get out when it's when it quits going up, then I get out. When the trailing stop tells me okay, it's not going up anymore, then I'll go ahead and get out. And also, if it hits my profit target and, and it gets so extremely uh, overbought, then I'll just go ahead and lock it in at times. But I, I'm mm-hmm. very very patient with my winners. And very, very impatient with losing trades. That makes sense, yeah. The way I've been uh, shifting this a little bit is um, finding better profit targets, I guess you could say, and and loss targets where, where I'm going to go ahead and exit the trade. So that's been super beneficial to me. So chapter seven, you say, new traders bet the farm where rich traders carefully control trading size. Um, I recently had a... T- um, there's an episode of the podcast you should look up called uh, How to Actively Manage a Portfolio as a College Student. And Adriel Solorzano in there, in that particular episode, he talks about a, a PDF he came across where uh, it was called, I believe it was called How to Lose Money Trading Derivatives or something like that. <laughs> he said the key thing to that was size. Size beyond mm-hmm. all uh, was the determinant factor. Oh, Absolutely. You know, don't bet your don't don't bet your farm to win a chicken. And don't bet don't bet your farm <laughs> trying to win three farms. You know, with no farm. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like if people have a 100% return one year, and then they have a 50% drawdown the next year, they're right back where they started. The mm-hmm. cumulative cumulative, you know, that's why uh, you know triple quadruple leverage ETFs. You know, the ones that have huge leverage. That's why they deteriorate over time, not because they're building to deteriorate, because when the when they go down, there's less capital to go back up with on the company. Yes. You know, it yeah. takes a 100% return to come back from a 50% drawdown, and that's what you want to avoid. If you just have a 10% drawdown, it takes 11% to get back. If you have a 20% drawdown, it takes 25% return to get back. So, you know, trading too big, big losses is the number one reason people are unprofitable trading. If you eliminate yeah. big losses, you have a much better odds of success. Yeah, and, and even just like you could have 10 – trades in a row be losers and then having that 11th trade be a nice winner and if you've let all 10 of those before the 11th one uh get out of control that 11th one is not even going to make up for for the prior 10 just like i was saying earlier you know if you had an option spread and it's going to take you uh more than three full winners to make up for one loser you know you're stacking the odds against you in that case and oh go ahead yeah that's one that's what i really haven't i've gotten away from selling options short and credits Spreads. I just don't like the oh, risk really? reward ratios. Yeah, I, like I get that. High I, I reward, for sure get low that. risk. You know, one thing that uh, that I created 
Um, and, and I say I created because I couldn't find anybody on the internet doing this. And I, I reached out to to many many people in the trading community that they had never heard of this before. Was uh, I created something that I call the Better Call. And uh, essentially what you do is you would sell a put spread, uh, maybe just out of the money, maybe a 40 delta put spread. And let's say it's a dollar wide, so you're collecting about 40, 40 cents on the trade. And then you look for an out of the money call, maybe for uh, 30 or 20 cents or something less than the original credit that you've taken in. So now you've built a high probability uh, mm-hmm. trade. And you still have the potential for that call going in the money and uh, and the stock really taking off and, and being a part of that trend. So yeah, that that's something I, I've been trying to to do as well because I the the biggest reason I love trading options is because you can get super duper tiny. You can get trades mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. you know they're forty or fifty dollars in risk, mm-hmm. and you can put man I. I I'm, <laughs> I'm sure with an account like yours, you could put on literally thousands of accounts like that. And, you know, you don't have to worry about them so much. You put on profit targets, you put on exit targets, and then you've got all these little guys, you know, you're putting all your workers out in the factory because you've made them so small. You don't have to worry about one individual key man risk if you want to put it in business terms there. Yeah. I, one time I used to back, I think it was a 2012, 2012 trade, I believe, where I had a, back when Apple was about $500 a share before it split, I was, mm-hmm. I had 10 contracts of Apple in a, in a long option straddle while I was mm-hmm. controlling a million dollars in Apple with 10 contracts, $500 a share, wow. uh, $10 out in both directions for a long, uh, long strangle option trade. And uh, mm-hmm. the morning then Apple, I get dumped $40 a share or something. I made, you know, I made a, uh, uh, netted thousands of dollars in profit and just, I just held it at the close the previous day till the open the next day. So it would have, t- it would have been a million dollars to have that trade on in actual stock. And I had it on yeah. for a few thousand dollars in options. Exactly. And that, that's my, my favorite thing about options is, is the, uh, the way you can just scale it down so small. And plus it's so, so nimble, right? You know, you can put on bearish trades, bullish trades, neutral trades. You can put on um, bearish to neutral trades, like a, uh, a call credit spread, things like that. Yeah, you can uh, bet, the you flexibility can bet, you can, of it. Yeah. You can bet more than short and long. You can bet something's going to go up, something's not going to go up, how much is going to go up, what time is going to go up or not go exactly. up. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, our expansion of volatility or contraction of volatility. I mean, options do give you every dimension of, of, uh, bets on the stock market. Right. Absolutely. So let's move on to the next chapter here. New traders try to prove they're right. Rich traders admit they're wrong. And that has a lot to do with uh, the the stuff between your ears. Yeah, it's amazing where you know rich traders, all that I've studied, they quickly you know stop loss hit, they're wrong, they move on, they could care less. And mm-hmm. a lot of new traders are obsessed with proving they're right, and their call was right, and they predicted something, and they want to hold on. If it pulls back to even, that's just a very bad road to go down. Or or uh, jumping on the train of uh, averaging down. Right, adding to losers uh, in order to prove themselves right. Yeah, that's a lot. There's a lot of emotionality that I don't think many people realize. You know, from the outside looking in, uh, what goes on with uh, with the trader's head. Yeah, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, pitcher in his office, a picture that Michael Covell shared a long time ago. It said he, PD, PTJ had on his on his wall, "Losers average losers." I think since mm-hmm. that, I haven't I haven't averaged down a loser. And uh, since I've seen that picture, that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> wow. So one part I'm looking in chapter 10, and there were a few bullet points here that I wanted to go through. Uh, I, I really like these these in particular, and that's why I wanted to to bring them up. So Steve had a few different points. Read your trading rules and trading plan before trading every day. Never hope for a bounce back. Cut your losses at your predetermined stop and and uh, exit the trade. Always exercise discipline. Follow your predetermined trading plan. Don't overtrade. A successful trade is a trade that follows your trading plan and your system, even if it's wrong. Don't allow outside distractions during entries and exits. When you're trading, only focus on trading execution. Your opinion does not matter, only price action. <laughs> Never try to predict. Follow trends, trend reversals, and your signals. Never fall into the trap of hindsight. Instead, focus on real time trading. Always respect the market and don't become arrogant. If you took these several bullet points, you could make an incredible trading plan on that based on uh, probably 
a hundred years of cumulative experience that Steve has read and put into those those bullet points there. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, once you have your trading plan and trading system in place and you have faith in yourself and you have the discipline to follow it, uh, and, it's, and it's an edge, you have an edge, you have to have an edge to, do, to work your trading system. But once you do that, uh, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. You just have to have it where the market is conducive to your specific trading strategy, whatever that is. As you move through that market, you can, you can make a lot of money and compound it over the years. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, uh, you know, starting on Chapter 11, uh, to, to Steve's point, you can work your trading plan and then for years uh, use it for your favor, right? Here he says most new traders quit. Rich traders persevere in, in the market until they're successful. And a lot of this chapter had to do with the fact that new traders take on so much risk and when they when they don't get the returns that they expect, they're either losing money or they're not making enough. They they decide that it's not for them. But rich traders, they persevere until they are successful. And really, I, I think you could take Steve's point and apply that to anything. You could apply it to basketball. I quit basketball. <laughs> I am not built for basketball. LeBron James, he <laughs> persevered and became incredible at basketball. Uh, Tiger Woods. He's built for golf. He persevered and became incredible at golf. I have uh, played putt putt a couple of times. So I, I, I mean that to Steve's point here is that you know a, a a trader is just like any other profession, any other sport, or any other uh, anything you want to say that there's a novice and an expert. It takes time. I mean, you've got people like uh, Timothy Sykes who talk about how they've turned 14,000, their bar mitzvah money into $4 million. And when people don't have those returns, it's discouraging. So I, yeah, I really empathize with that one. Yeah, it's it's the cynics out there, even the worst cynics saying nobody can beat the market. Nobody can beat the SP 500. You know, everybody's, uh, it's uh, it's all a waste of time to actively trade or to actively uh, have a trading system. And the, the so cynical, like I'll post compound growth of capital tables on Facebook, on my personal Facebook, just showing people what you can do if you took capital, compounded it over a long period of time. I'll just use like 8%. And uh, people come out endlessly and say, that's impossible. Where are you going to get 8%? This is crazy. And I'm like, man, I did this in real time. I really did that. I have the money. I'm financially independent. I'm done. I did that with uh, with several huge bull market runs. I mean, even buy and hold and spy got about 8% on average. Mm-hmm. So I don't understand the cynicism for people who they failed or they weren't able to do it or they went through their own pain. So they project their cynicism of impossibility on everybody. You know, most people can't play NFL football, but there are several thousands of successful NFL football players over the last 40 years. Hey, that's a it. great point. They yeah, didn't absolutely. make it. There are they're saying, that, oh, nobody can play NFL football. It's a complete waste of time to go play high school football or college football. It's impossible. No. It's the people who go through, like you said, there are people that really did it. To be cynical and say it's impossible is just absurd. Yeah, well said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the next couple of chapters here, uh, I'm going to tie 14 and 15 together. One of the things you say in 14 is new traders try to predict. Rich traders follow what the market's telling them. And then in 15, new traders trade against the trend. Rich traders follow the market trend. Now, like I said earlier, I was the guy who decided that I'm going to call the the top and I'm going to call the bottom and I'm going to hold this no matter what. Deal with it. And <laughs> unfortunately, I was the one dealing with it versus the market. <laughs> so so to, to me, my first question when I read this is what – what to you says this is the market trend, right? New traders try to predict, rich traders follow what the market's telling them, and then combining that with rich traders follow the market trend. What to you says this is the trend or the, the trend is changing? Yeah, the, the first question is, you know, <clears throat> what is – what the, your time frame determines your trend. You know, a day trader will have a different trend than a, than a, than a daily chart trader and a weekly chart trader. And a, like a buy and holder has, you know, mm-hmm. 30, 40 years of their trend if they're going to buy and hold the SP 500. So different time frames. But the key is higher highs and higher lows are lower highs and lower lows over the time frame you're looking at. Whenever you see, you know, descending trend lines connecting those higher, higher highs or, or lower lows, you know, over and over again, and you are moving average. You see prices on the the top of above the 10-day moving average for 10 straight days, and then the short-term trend is up. If it's underneath the 200-day moving average for a, a month, the, the long-term trend is down. There's some ways to filter that. 
Mm-hmm. So when you see something like we've had since Christmas, essentially, where the market's almost gone straight up, where it's gone, I think it's gone up 15% in just under a month or something crazy like that. Uh, and, and you look at a chart, right? It, the I was just looking at this yesterday, so I'm somewhat familiar. Uh, it's well above the 10. The 10 and 50 are about to cross, and it's it's pointing straight up at the 200. Do you feel yeah. that that's a, a trend reversal, or do you feel that this is a, a really strong dead cat bounce? Well, right now, for much quantification for me, that's an upswing in a downtrend. Once we went yeah. up to 200 okay. day, 250 day, that was a downtrend, and then we had an upswing in the downtrend ah, uh, above okay. the 10 above the 10 day moving average. That's so well said we, right there. Okay. Once we break and close above that 200 day, and then we can make some some higher highs and higher lows above it, then we will have reinstated the uptrend. That's most of my system are based on a 250 or 200 day moving average. Once mm-hmm. you get back above that. But the key is if this is a real downtrend, then we should see resistance come in at the 200 day moving average around that zone. And if we become overbought, if it goes too fast, you end up with a 70 RSI and it goes overbought and then you mm-hmm. have and you have resistance at the 200 day. That would be a real sign for me that that was a dead cat bounce. and We're going to go lower. OK, yeah, I was watching it and I was I was talking to some people yesterday that um, I I've been really gun shy because we had such a strong downturn. Then then we were having this such strong upturn. I mean, I'm like, whoa, you know, I I. I don't want to be the guy who's caught on both sides wrong, you know? Uh, so as I've said before, cash is a position and if cash is the position your entry plan tells you to be in, that's, that's a very viable place to be. Yeah. I had, and I had several long trigger, short term, uh, swing trades, like five day, 20 day moving average crossovers. And uh, mm-hmm. like you said too, I actually have a 10 day, 50 day moving average crossover signal to go long several positions. So I do have some long positions on in the upswing, but most of my my next parameters will be how it reacts to the 200 day moving average. Because even in downtrends in bear markets, you can still have rallies back to 200 day before you go lower. Yeah, yeah, and and I would be interested to see uh, to see you know what happens with that for sure. So let's look at chapter 16. New traders follow their emotions, which puts them at a disadvantage, and rich traders follow systems that give them an advantage. And I think the key here uh, is knowing your entry and your exit criteria and having written them down and holding yourself to those. Because in the moment, you could be doing anything and not actually believing those entry and exit criteria. But it, to Steve's point, if if you're, uh, I believe one of the examples in here is if your stock price comes down and hits your 20-day moving average after it's already been up 5%, that's a great place to exit. Even though you may feel that it has room to run, the price action uh, is telling you otherwise. Yeah, if you can develop faith in your system through either back testing to quantify it has an edge, or uh, you understand the risk-reward ratio, you understand you're going to have small loss or big wins, and you, or you understand a historical historical filter for your system. If you can develop that faith in your process and system, it's just a matter of, of following it. That'll that'll help you and help get rid of a lot of the emotions and the ego. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and that leads into chapter 17. R- new traders uh, don't know when to cut losses or lock in gains, whereas rich traders have an exit plan. I mean, you know, above all in this book, uh, you know, the rich trader telling the younger new trader, uh, I mean, pretty much on every page is have a plan, have a plan, have a plan, mm-hmm. have a plan, develop your plan, make it work. And then, uh, you know, trade to that plan. And if that plan isn't working for this market, uh, maybe you need to adjust it. But the whole key is to not just fly by the seat of your pants, but actually <laughs> actually have an idea of what you're going to do. It's amazing. And in no realm of success does anyone just show up and do random things. You know, executives don't show up in business meetings and just start throwing things against the wall. Uh, you know, football players all have a game plan. Entrepreneurs have business plans. And I exactly. just understand why people want to enter the toughest thing to do uh, trade in the financial markets and just try to fly by the seat of their pants based on their own opinions which yeah, is the absolute well roadmap to losing money yeah for sure i mean like like to your point you know movie directors have a script and <laughs> you know board directors have a uh, have an agenda for their um for their employees right and you could think of it this way you are the president of your company each one of your dollars is an employee you're going to be putting them all to work and if if they are doing something wrong you need to interject and say, hey, please stop doing that. Do the right thing. 
And then, you know, you're going to be moving them off of one tray that's not working and moving into another tray that hopefully is working. That's kind of how I look at it, right? Mm-hmm. You're the president yeah. of the company. Mm-hmm. Each one of those dollars is your employee. You, you're you putting them to work. Exactly. And uh, if, if they're not doing what you, you expect them to, is your boss just going to let you just, you know, continue <laughs> to, to, to steal money out of the tin? No, he's going to stop you and he's going to correct your course. It's just like a casino. If you're If you're in a casino and you don't own the casino, then you are the gambler. Yep. And a casino has a business plan, a business model, and they execute a small edge over every bet. That's where the giant uh, hotels and, and uh, casino buildings come from. Gamblers tr- betting against them while the casino has the edge. You, it, As a trader, you want to have that edge. And to your point, right, it, it's the small edges that really add up over time because mm-hmm. – you know, they're taking in tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of bets per day. And each one of those, if they're only scraping a dollar off of it, doesn't take much if you're doing enormous volume to grow an empire. Uh, and that, that's mm-hmm. that's what I'm taking away from Steve's point is you don't mm-hmm. you don't need a lot of uh, of over over wins here, like giant wins, lottery type wins. You just need to be able to find a plan that will work to allow you to have a greater win rate, uh, especially dollar wise than, than a losing rate. Yeah. C- compounding of the long term is much safer to grow money than trying to go for the big, big bets in the short term. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we've essentially gone through Steve's entire book, which, which I really appreciate the fact that he's, he's allowed us to, uh, you know, have, have this nice discussion on the book. And, and I certainly encourage you to go get your own, um, I didn't want to sit here and, uh, you know, be the audiobook version of his book, but I had a lot of questions and certainly uh, was excited to for the opportunity to uh, to talk to Steve about this. I don't I don't know if Steve's given a, any other uh, book interviews like this before, but man, I am exceptionally grateful for the opportunity to do so on the podcast. Yeah, I think that worked out really well. I think I really expanded on a lot of the concepts. Yeah, for sure. Um, and now I'm looking forward to the other 19 that uh, <laughs> we have to go through. <laughs> no, I tell you what, to, Steve. To tell the truth, if if I feel that I can improve my trading plan after I've been doing this for a year, uh, not a year, after I've been doing this for 10 years, <laughs> after just reading this one book, uh, man, I am I am excited, extremely excited to see what's next. And I recommend that that all the podcast listeners go out, either get the uh, the Kindle version of this or the the paperback version of this. Uh, I, I've got links down below where you can pick up your copy from Amazon and have it shipped to you right away. Because uh, this book is is really fantastic. I mean, like I say, I've, I've been doing this for a decade. And so many times did I identify with New Trader. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can only imagine, you know, how much how much more I have to learn if uh, if this is the case so far. So, Steve, what what's our next book going to be? Uh, oh, for us on the, the podcast? Yes. What What do you want to do next? Well, uh, people are really happy when they love that book and they give it a five star review and they find out that there's a sequel, <laughs> New Trader, Rich Trader. Oh, you're kidding! This, <laughs> good, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Good, good trades, bad trades. Uh, oh, so that's what's called good trades, bad trades. No, it's it's New Trader, Rich Trader two, and the okay. subtitle is Good Trades, Bad Trades. So it's a difference between a good trade and a bad trade. Oh man, I didn't know this existed. Here we go. Okay. Uh, New Trader Rich, I'm making notes here too. <laughs> I will also link that down below. So you're going to have links for uh, the current book, New Trader Rich Trader. You're going to have uh, uh, links to ETFreplay.com as well as Stock Charts, and then links to New Trader Rich Trader 2. And that will be uh, where Steve and I go on the next uh, How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast, where he and I get to, uh, to talk about these books. Oh, man. Uh, Steve, this has been an absolute wealth of, of knowledge here, especially being able to, to read this and share this with the podcast audience. And, and I certainly feel that uh, this would be worth your time. It's not that long a read either. No, uh, but not. man, the, uh, the content inside of here is, is definitely worth the, uh, the $10 or so that you may have to pay for it. I think it's even less than that, but I'm not sure what it was today. So anyway, uh, Steve, thank you so much for, for coming back on today. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you and I have connected and that we can share this with, with both of our audiences and hopefully improve improve some lives. That's the way I look at things like this. Yep, great, uh, great talking to you, Chris. Hope it helps some people out there. Absolutely. So that wraps up today's How to Trade Stocks and Options <laughs> podcast. Oh. Oh, a German Shepherd bark. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's going to be – I'd love to keep that in, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So that wraps up today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. We give you the tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And we'll see you on the next episode.
Hey, thank you so much for listening to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. I know you're a listener, but are you a watcher? Make sure you head on over to YouTube, type in 10 Minutes Stock Trader, and subscribe to the 10 Trader.com YouTube channel. Every week, I upload all the podcasts as full videos, and that way you're getting the full 10-minute trading experience. That way you can have all the tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter. Make sure you subscribe to whatever podcast app you're listening to, and leave me a five-star review if you don't mind. That would be fantastic. And whenever you're done with that, head on over to 10MinuteStockTrader.com and download the one-minute options trading quick start guide. It'll give you all the tools, tips, and tricks that I use in my own portfolio, and it never gets outdated, and it will apply to every single options trade out there, so I think it'll be pretty useful for you. And while you're there, check out the free portfolio page. That'll show you everything that I've traded over the last year in full transparency. And since you're on the website already, check out the free trading course. In this free trading course, I give you every single thing that I know and use in my own portfolio, and I definitely think it'll help you out too. And then after you're done there, head on over to tastyworks.com and sign up using the code 10 minute. That's one zero M I N U T E. And I'll send you over $150 in free 10 minute trader exclusive bonuses from 10 minutestocktrader.com. And most of all, thank you so much for letting me be a part of your day. I really appreciate the fact that you and I have connected today and that you've chosen to put me inside your earbuds. That means the absolute world to me. And thank you so much for stopping by. 10MinuteStockTrader.com content is for information and educational purposes only. It is not, nor is it intended to be, trading or investment advice or recommendation that any security, futures contract, options contract, transaction, or other financial instrument or strategy is suitable for any person. Trading securities can involve high risk and the potential for total loss of any funds invested. 10MinuteStockTrader.com and Christopher Ewell, through its content, financial programming, or otherwise, does not provide investment or financial advice or make investment recommendations. Investment information provided may not be suitable for all investors and is provided without respect to the individual investors and audience's financial sophistication, financial situation, investing time horizon, or risk tolerance. Tim and StockTrader.com and Christopher Ewell are not in the business of trading securities trades, nor does it direct client commodity accounts or give commodity trading advice, tailored to any particular client situation or investment objectives. Tim and StockTrader.com and Christopher Ewell are not licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Stocks, options, futures, futures options, and other financial instruments not included here involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You alone are responsible for making your investment and financial trading decisions and for evaluating the merits and risks associated with the use of any financial security and broker platform. For more information, please visit 10minutestocktrader.com legal. And thanks for stopping by.